So, you were uh, at the beginning of all of this stuff, uh, and which was a very exciting time. Sure, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, it was kind of going off into the unknown with everything was brand new. And um, it was going to change how we do things, but no one knew exactly how oh, yeah. or, or what it was going to be. And, um, and today, uh, we do. But how has this impacted the lives of ordinary people, do you think, today? Well, a lot of ordinary people carry these every day. They're with them all the time. This is a smartphone, and even if your smartphone's not a big, fancy smartphone, if it has Android or the Mac, the iOS, uh, these types of phones, they feed us a lot of information. And the way that they feed us that information in a way that's relevant and important to us and in a way that sells products is they, they know how we behave. They know what matters to us. And so the upside of that is I get fed the, the news I'm interested in. I get fed the products that I'm interested in. Uh, I have the ability to search for anything I want whenever I want to and to learn about things that I want to learn about in the moment that I have a question about it, which is something unprecedented and unimaginable. 30 years ago, this was just not an idea, right? I mean, it was an idea, but it wasn't like this, right? Um, but, you know, when we clicked OK on having our behavioral data recorded, that's what ultimately enabled that type of personalization and that type of prediction and that type of understanding who people are and who people are in groups. So when we think of ourselves, we tend to think of ourselves in like racial terms or political terms or religious terms. We tribe ourselves in different ways. But imagine that today, and, and it's a real thing, our, our behavioral data allows those capable of looking at it and applying the math to it that lets it do stuff like that's ultimately like really complex statistics. But based on whatever question they have at the time, we can be put in new tribes of people based on the behaviors that they care about reaching us on, right? So I care about certain things, I look at certain things, I do it at certain times of the day, I shop for certain types of items. Anybody who's ever put anything in their Amazon cart that they never bought and then was stalked through Facebook for an ad, that's exactly that stuff, right? That's exactly that stuff. It also affects what news we see. It affects what's on our Facebook feed. It affects the conversations that we have. And going back to what I was saying about my job as a product manager is about finding the, the profitable connection point between the things that matter to other people and what, that, what, what they want to look at, what they want to interact with, what they want to buy, and us making money as a company, right? That's, and I've worked for a lot of different companies. Uh, there are two uh, goals, we call them metrics, but ultimately they're business goals. Two of the most important ones are engagement and retention, which is a fancy way of saying, are you involved with it? <laughs> And are you paying, it? like, do you repeatedly come back, right? And so what does that for different people is now pretty understandable in a big way, in a mathematical way, based on what type of behavioral result you want. Okay. That's really cool stuff. And um, that is uh, really great for the people collecting the information. And that is the business today. Yes. And how, how does that impact um, media today, where we get our things? If everything is so directed to you because of that is something, it's a personal preference. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're getting fed things, only things that you like, only things that you're interested in. There's kind of a, kind of a problem with that. If we're just being fed on our feed. <laughs> yeah, so you're bringing up a really important unintended consequence, which is very, uh, which is very useful. So if we stay away from um, conspiracy theorizing and we just talk about um, how 
how we optimize as a capitalist democracy, right? Where, because money votes now, right? We, we gave corporations personhood and we allow them to, to, to be citizens of the United States and vote with money. And money, I, I think a lot of folks, regardless of how you may feel about it, understand that that's a part of how our system works. And when you think about the optimizations that capitalism makes without being critical, right? We optimize on making money at the lowest cost possible. And, uh, and so that's, that, that's just how we do things, right? Now, and if we go back to what I just mentioned is that any business, and Facebook is a business, they're an advertising business. Just like Google is an advertising business. Ultimately, that's where they make those billions of dollars that folks hear about, right? And the way that they do that is that the people who use them are the product. And that's the big difference between 38, 40 years ago and now, is that we are the product. How we behave is the product. And our behavior, our digital behavior, is not our property. And the very fact that that, that data is not our property here allows a lot of things. And some of the things that it, that it allows based on how folks who are optimizing to make money they're going to optimize on how often you get in here and how long you stay and the best way to make sure that people come back you know we're, we're still we're still we're very smart monkeys but we're, we're still got a lot of our animal brains right and as product people we are trained to look at what's addictive right what what elicits the strongest emotions what involves people right what keeps them coming back why is this exciting why is this stimulating why do i need to check this over 200 times a day why am why am i in facebook as soon as i wake up in the morning why am i in it more than 100 times a day well because i'm stimulated by it and some of the most powerful stimulating emotions we have as, as the type of smart monkey we are, is anger, is fear. These are very addictive emotions. And that's like, and our industry has gone to the science, right? This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's just an optimization act. If you want consistency in people's attention and continued interaction, if you get people where, the, where, where, where it moves them the most, which is what are you most afraid of? What, what, what makes you uncomfortable? What, what, what gets a rise out of you, right? And what, what has come to get a rise out of people is differences of opinion, right? So I have, I have dear family back home in Michigan who are evangelical Christians. And they are my family and I love them, right? I love them, they're my family. We don't agree about a lot. I'm out here in the blue bubble and there's all kinds of criticism of us out here, right? Uh, but I go home and I sit down to dinner and we talk about really hard things, really hard things. And we don't agree. Oh golly, we do not agree. I'm a Buddhist. They're evangelical Christians, right? They're, they're concerned for my well-being and I appreciate the fact that they're concerned for my well-being. And we sit down to dinner and we talk. And the most important aspect of sitting down to that conversation is that we don't agree, but we are family. We are in this together. And that we put this down. Because when we curate the conversations that we have, so that we can either reduce our stress level and then always just be agreed with, we lose our ability to listen. The other thing that happens when we live inside this box is it feeds us the window to the world based on our taste and preferences, right? The things we like and, and what we want to buy and who we want to hear from in a way that's optimized to keep our interaction and our attention as much as possible so that we can be sold things, sold ideas, sold products, because our behavior is not our property and it's used to help have that happen.